So one of the amazing things is that you can replace all these loops by functions. And that's where the functionals arrive. Copy tags. I'm going to get okay. one of those. That's when I was going to spruce up the whole thing. Didn't work. So a functional, a function that takes a function as an input and returns a vector as an output. So we can iterate over functions. We have the ability to check or iterate over vectors. We can create pattern math exercise. Yeah, a mental switch. It requires changing the way we think. We, if we learn to think on loops and iterate and whiles, it takes a little while a, a, a shift because you stop thinking about one thing and, and the condition to exit the loop, but start thinking about the function is easier. It has a lazy evaluation, fewer side effects, it's better to read. And you can you have more flexibility when you work with functions. Um, in the book says, do not go crazy on functions, but Jenny Bryan in her in one of her books says, yeah, go ahead and do not use loops, start using functions. Uh, Haley was saying, Wickham was saying, if you do, if you repeat anything more than three times, just use a function, write a function. Mm. And Jenny Bryan said, used to say, he said this, a major objective, avoid writing this explicit for loops. Now, this goes beyond her tutorial. I'm going to add her tutorial in the chat notes. Give me one second, please. Add this one. Because I like it. She talks about for the power package. And it's really nice, very, very, very well. Um, also, I have, I'll be showing you something I used to cheat today. Okay, let's go back to functions. Map, and that's where the maps song was coming, but never mind. So you iterate over, you take a vector, then you give it a function and you apply the vector to that function. So, sorry, you apply the function to that vector, first element, then the second element, then the third element, and map generates a list. And of course, all of you, because all of you are doing your product, you know that comes from math, assign one set, the element to one set to the element, another set with the same set, but you map them. Um, from what I search is poor map is better than the base Laplace ap apply. I just missing one L because more consistent, it's faster, it's well-documented. It has less problems than the other one. So, Everywhere I've seen, but then again, is the bias on, on the places I look, they like better to use map. Uh, apply and all this are problematic. S apply has um, coercion and conversion, so you don't want those. Map is better. Problem with map is that everything is a list, but then again, as we will see forward, there are responses to that. Map returns a list. And all the other ones returns a logical element, an integer, and double fix, double precision fix floating point. And CHR returns character. Okay, there you go, respect it. That way you're not trapped in one thing. And at some point we had to talk about the exercises. Okay. Did I jump already last time? Okay. So atomic vectors, just vectors. You apply the function and you get the little graph on the book the, the, where the function goes to each one of the vectors. The easiest example is that the one with cars. For example, when you're asking that standard deviation of cars, you run um, function empty cars as the na dot rm equals true and you get standard deviation for all columns. 
atomic vectors, anonymous functions. And I'm cheating the background because I have this stuff that I, I know I don't have it. Okay, so the whole point of anonymous functions that instead of declaring the whole thing, instead of declaring the, the whole function, function x, curly brackets, function x, and the thing, you can just type the function and you can use cars, the twiddle, and dot x. That has implications later on when you have to distinguish dot x and dot f, but for now you can just create the data and the twiddle tilde, right? I don't know that. And that's it. Anything comment? Any comment? This is super useful. It I is, and we time. haven't yet gone to any further. Tell me, you were saying, Stephen. It's super useful. I, I use it like so often, so often. And this function that was the, this uh, function for the package, which is not discussed, is pluck, which, which you can literally pluck a value out and use it in other calculations. We didn't check this one. It was not. Apparently, it was used in previous, in previous examples. And this is important because it's part of the answer of one of the questions that are coming later. I don't want to delay, uh, stay here a little longer. We are not even going about the, the map. We're going to study all the functions and the functionals, which is, where did it go? Okay, arguments. This dot, dot, dot means that we can pass additional arguments, but we run into trouble because we have to be explicit. We have positional matching, we have name matching, and if we have arguments that are wrongly passed, we might imply one thing and mean the other. But for example, this whole list is, instead of having to pass the whole, the whole thing explicitly within mean, within the parentheses of the function, we can just use commas and pass all the arguments. Again, in this case, we know that the second argument of mean is an ARM true, that this refers to the first function. We are going to see examples later in which not having these this this name can cause problems but at the beginning is as you say very powerful you just give it a function uh the typical example everybody uses is empty cars mean nrm equals true um, it gives you the three column all the columns of of that argument names better to give full argument names to maintain clarity um per uses dot f and dot x to avoid conflicts and this is where this might be complicated. If you don't give the full name, you don't, it, it's just joking and you don't have the exact arguments that the function uses, you can get into trouble. Okay. Ah, I hate this one because they made it look very easy. Ah, oh yes, you can use another function and you can rearrange them. Um, yeah, of course. So you're going to get the means over this. So this is going to be your data and you use the stream you already specified in this function. Yes, if you say so, um, not that clear. There's later, we go to map two, and that's much easier. Like we're going to use this as an argument, the x was an argument, y is an argument, and the function, bah, easy, faster. Per, we write clear code. Uh, we use functions. For you that are right, for you or those of you that are writing packages, all this information might be interesting. An example in the book is taking, doing, oh, I didn't put that part. Okay, buy, sell, 
by cylinders is a list of three data frames in which they have split empty cars by cylinders. So we have three lists. So they map by sale using this function in which they do linear regression using this data. Coefficients, my double, please return the coefficients, please return the double, and we get this. As a, return it as a double, and we get this information. Had it been done on base, we get the, we had to find the intercepts and do a nice for loop that it's long and complicated, obtains the same information. This is easier and flows nicer when you're working on with pipes and for. There are three, 23 primary variants of map. So map one, map two is when it has two ingredients. I map is when we just one argument and an index P map, many arguments. And you have the atomic one, the same type when, and the when you want to return a function the uh, same type as the output. And you want to input matches the class of the output and do nothing when you want a function for the side effects, not for what it is, for example, write to file or save a plot. You just want to walk it. You don't want to see the outside of the results on the screen. Same type of output as input. If I wait a second, I'm going to check for something. I was going to check for exercises. Oh, okay. I forgot about that. Let me check something here. I cannot do anything. Okay. Okay. So we're now at the exercises. As mapper is one of the functions that work when you're working with map. And it helps convert map uh, and check what map needs to use in order to select logical a character and number. Second exercise map one three till the run if two is a useful pattern for doing the random numbers. The second one is not because this second one, map one three comma run if it only evaluates run if once. So you get the same thing. Whereas in the run if it evaluates run if the amount of times specified in this vector. Um, use the appropriate map function to compute the standard deviation in every column in every data frame. So I was saying empty cars comma SD comma not is not is not available and no. frame equals true compute the standard deviation of any numerical column in mixed data frame that means one in which you have categorical logical numeric values so with one map you choose all the columns that have numeric values is numeric the column and the other map is the same one we just mentioned above. Compute the number of levels for a factor in a data frame. The same thing. We just check all the in, in, in a data frame. We look for those columns that are levels, and then we choose the number so that they have count or some if they are values. The I, I had something to add to that. Yeah. For number first on number two. Yep. Yeah. The map one through three run if two is actually doesn't work because it uses the results from run if as an index. Like you're trying to pluck from an index. So it's using like the results of run if two, like it'll give you like 0.45, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and it says thinks that's trying to index into the vector one through three with the run if. I did browse on it to try to figure out like why it was doing what it was. And that's how, that's what it appeared to be doing is using those as indexes because it has that like uh, auto pluck feature when you use map, like you can put a named index or a numeric index and it'll just like pluck that yeah. number from every single list item. And so I think that's what's happening there with the run if to, Mm -hmm. uh, the two one and then on the 
the standard deviations and one, I think he's looking for the map if functions, but I'm not sure maybe he's not because he hasn't gone over those yet. So but they say that you do in two steps, um, one way oh, is the numeric yeah. ones and leave the other ones around. Yeah. Uh, that's, well, that's it. Yeah. Code uses, uh, okay, simulate the performance of t-test for non-normal data, extract the p-value from each test and visualize. Uh, you guys go ahead. <laughs> um, well, this is what Steven was saying. You can map over trials and then just put the name, it's, it's p.value, and then it'll extract. Mm -hmm. And then if, if you map double, you can just make a histogram or whatever. Yeah. The following code. I didn't do this one. Yeah, I didn't. That's the. That's where I stopped on the exercises. I forgot to read until today. It's been a week. Yeah. <laughs> Too many Saturdays. Too many people having uh, dinners. That was crazy. Um. <clears throat> I look at this and it didn't make sense. And one of the answers that, oh, I remember X map dot F equal triple when this dot F doesn't work because it assigns the dot F at the outside. Oh, what happened here? At the outside map. So, okay, where are my exercises? I am. I promise you I'm going to put all the exercises back. I read about that one and lost it. Anyways. I lost it. Huh. It's under the 9.2.6. You click that on the side exercises. There we go. So you are far more awake than I am. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so yes, this was x map dot f triple. What happens is that this triple, this dot f, is interpreted as being the triple from the outside map, not the inside map, and causes an error. The solution it was simple as remove the names x map triple, and just positional matching will indicate that x map and triple go correctly. That goes back to mm -hmm. the whole discussion about environments and how mm -hmm. the positional matching, the, the, the name matching has to be careful when you are applying the name and to which are you applying the name. Yeah. Okay, use map to fill linear models to empty cars, I said, using the formulas stored in this list. So you make uh, the formulas is a data set and you apply the formulas in the, in the sorry, in that list to the empty cars. I don't remember if I did that correctly. But it seemed like you would apply the formula, you design the data frame and then you apply the formula in the data frame. I don't remember that one, no. And seven, I didn't do either, no. Mm -hmm. And most of these require reading all over the place because it's not. So since I didn't do more exercises, I'm going to go back to my little functional screen. Where did it go? Poor style. Okay, hello. Modify, same time of output as input. We want a data frame. If we want to, if we use map, we get a list. We want a data frame, we will use modify data frame, the function dot x is squared, and we get a data frame. The structure of all these is a data frame, three observations, numerical. Mm. Map two and friends, two inputs, map two, map logical to map character, map whatever. It writes are two vectors and the inputs are recycled if they are the same length. Oops, I didn't do any examples. Okay. Um, so you were saying, for example, you want to know about the displacement and 
going back to the cars, empty cars displacement, and my spare gallon, and do some function over those. You can use these two vectors. Either two vectors do not have the same size they recycle. Now outputs work again, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want this. You want these functions only because they create something for you later. So save, write, cat. And I remember what cat was because I forgot already. So in this case, they use the work in order to create the file path and write this split empty cards out of frames into two, three different frames. Again, as Stephen said, very powerful. IMAP, iterating over values and indices. So interesting construction of labels. Iterate F over X and Y, which is typo derived from names of vector. So you know I did this because I have typos, horrible. Interestingly, if you don't give the Y goes automatically for the names of the vector. If there is no name on the vector, then it goes for the index. And then this is all examples from the book. I'm up, I trace or iris and paste the first value of the name is the name of X, X1. And the first value of the name is the value and so on. And for those in which we don't have a name, we just mapping over an unnamed vector, we just have the highest value of one and goes to the index one third. Any number of inputs. Any message? Okay, supply a list with the different arguments and map X, Y, F is equal to the PMAP list X, Y, and F. So you supply it the list of inputs you want to iterate over the function and what X means, and it gives you the whole thing. We, I didn't go through this one triple, but triple allows a user data frame as described row by row and pass those arguments as a function. And one of the examples that we saw that was passing data frame as a list of functions, but didn't have an example. I didn't have an example on this one. The reduce. Do we have exercises? I don't remember. No, for six. Did you do the exercises for uh, uh, 946? We can go to those. I think I looked at all of them. Okay. I think I tried to do most of them. Uh, didn't, I definitely didn't do most of them, but I certainly tried. <laughs> um, okay, let's share this one. Modify. Modify takes data frame and outputs of the frame. Empty cars one. Doesn't that just the same data frame? It repeats the top line. The top line. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it takes the top integer and just applies it to every other row. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, bit of a weird one. <laughs> okay. Um, I walk instead of walk two. I didn't do that because I got lost. Uh, walk two is the one that uses two arguments. I walk uses only one. Walk two seems easier. So I couldn't really go through that. The difference is you, you just have to assign the names or the paths as the name of the of the data that you're passing in there. You'd have to put it, each of them into a list and put the paths as the names and then you could use IMAP. Okay, that they will. Sorry, I walk. You, I walk. 
And this is where you transform other frame user functions stored in a list. You pass the list and let me see if I remember. No, I don't. Yeah, these are the ones I didn't do. Okay. Feel like high school again. Shall we move to the reduce family? Reduce family. Okay. So reduce right. takes a function. Sorry. Uh never mind. I was I was You're going to say about this one? Yeah. Uh it takes the disk function and the disk column. Yes. And it just multiplies every value in that column times the scalar value 0.016 or whatever. And then for the second one, it takes the AM column and just turns it into that factor with auto and manual and replaces that in the actual empty cars. And then that second one is actually wrong. Um, I opened an issue about it, but I think he meant to use MT cars with the name mm -hmm. in M uh, variable to index into it instead of ours because ours like isn't there. Yeah. Um, but it just takes the actual, uh, it just takes the names of the, uh, the trans list. And it uses that to index into the trans list and get the function. And then it calls that function on empty cars and it indexes in and gets using the name and like pulls it out as a vector and calls it on that. And then resaves it back over to the empty cars. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's written wrong. I think write CSV returns the file name, but I am not certain of that. Oh, write write CSV returns um, when you um, when you do that. That actually returns null because it's uh, walking over it, isn't it? So there's no so what it does is it um, writes the file name onto the onto the function as a side effect, which is what you've called it for. But then when it's returned back into the system, it will just say null. Nothing. So it will give yeah. So it gives the, like the um, it gives the factor, I believe. Uh, so that would be what is it? What was it on here? Um, is it? Um, uh, they do it over the uh, cylinders, don't they? So they have they write down the the three mm. cylinders, and then it just so it says uh, no afterwards. Mm. Okay, let's go to or reduce. So it takes a vector of length n, produce a vector of length one, but taking a function uh, with two values at a time. So the little graph that you saw in the book was taken a vector and was going through each one of the of the elements. Uh, the typical example that they say, what's the list of elements that are present in many lists? So you get a list you get a list and you intersect all of them. So you intersect first with second, second with third, third with four, and that way you basically are passing the function, the function, the function of one. Mm. You're applying the results of the, the, the first function to the second, to the third. First two vectors, you apply the function to those, the results of vector, you apply the function to the third, you apply the function to the fourth. The result until the fourth until so you you got a result. Um, let me check what is this thing. Okay, 
typical example was that take a sample, produce, will take the sample and use intersect to find all the things, all, all the common elements for all the elements on the list. And accumulate is the same thing, but it returns the intermediate results in which you have all the intermediate results of applying these to vectors one, lists one and two, the intermediate results apply list to the result of the previous one and three, and the results of these and four, and then you get. And we got here to dot in it. Reduce does not check if the output is valid. You can reduce, you can apply reduce to vector types and elements that are size zero or one. And if you don't define that in it, that dot in it, you may have problems. Oh, I didn't write anything about that. Okay. Um, for example, if your function is not defined at zero or one, when you apply that, it won't have a result. If you define the init equals zero, you will have a result. For example, when you are adding, adding zero equals the same amount. Because when you are reducing or multiplying, you have to have the identity function, basically. You have to define what the um, function will be at that particular zero point. Let me guess, output times, multiple. These are reduced to, but these most likely need what the init would be. And this is a very specialized scenario, according to Wickham. Basically, you are passing two lists, two arguments to the function, and the function will start to reduce based on the first and the second vectors. If you don't define an init, they will have a different um, a different result. The init is what happens when you arrive at the zero, at the zero vector, at a vector of line zero or line one. No example was given and map reduce. And now they talk about map reduce, um, Hadoop, the famous Google algorithm. You spread the data over machines, you do map in different machines, and then you reduce over one coordinator machine. Mm -hmm. The predicates, we arrive at the predicates. A single value, true or false. The basic sum is any match, everyone, true if all vectors match. Detect returns the, fail, the value of the first match and detecting this returns the location of the first match. Keep, keeps all matching elements, discard, drops all matching elements. Mm. Have you used any of these? Some on every detect? I know that yeah. return, the function to return single value we use is character is no, uh, is an A, we you, you all use that all the time. But have you used the following, the, 961 ones, some every detect, detect index. Have you used those? I've only used the base, like any or all, but now reading this, I should probably switch. <laughs> it, they, they look interesting. Yeah, I'm, it seems it's... like it gives a little bit more speed because it terminates as soon as it finds a match, but I don't, I mean, it also adds a per dependency so mm. it's kind of a trade-off there. I didn't even I didn't know about sum or every or detect or detect index. I've not used any of those, but I have used keep and discard a number of times. That's useful for just clearing out like list if there if there was something you were doing and it, it failed in certain places. Uh, you can just like get rid of any things that failed by using the predicate, or there's also compact, which is very similar, um, which just gets rid of all the a list, all the null values in a list. Now we move to map variants. Map and modify have a variant that uses p as a predicate when p e, dot p is true. 
So take the data frame and we look at the element when, for example, data frame is numeric, what the data frame is valid. And as we so keep them all or drop them all, do the, do the thing. Base functionals, more statistical, less poor, more use for people that like statistics. So, oh, these are the things that I did. Matrices and arrays, base apply for work with matrices and arrays. Results to simplify, not in to potent, they don't apply to identity. Never use with a data frame or feed it after midnight. Courses to a matrix and matrices. Some people like matrices. Not me. Supply also, we mentioned earlier, it simplifies the whole thing. Mm. Mm, apply the summary function. Okay. Now we use apply with identity function. What are my concerns? Oh, this integrate. Um, never see this one. Never saw this once. Finds the area under the curve defined by f for the function. Only root finds the function hits zero, and optimize finds the location the lowest or highest value of f. Um. Never tried these ones, never used these ones. I can think of a few places where they can be a value, but also not, don't think I've used this for data analysis. Every. I have to unmute you. Give me one second. <laughs> Got to show you a couple of things that I found. Okay, Emily requested that we talk about how we've used these in practice. I don't know. I I pretty much use per like every day, but. Every day. <laughs> One thing that's useful that I did like last week was um, the list, list, list dot files. Do you guys know that function? Mm -hmm. um, so I listed all the data files and then use map to read them all in to a list and then bind them together. And then it ha keeps the names. If you use bind underscore rows and then dot ID, it'll add an ID column with the list name the names from the list which is super nice i'm afraid of of um idioms and dependencies that we may introduce we're working on these things uh force seems to be solid enough base it seems okay as well but many of these uh, many of these other packages are they show mm -hmm. up they stop development at 0 0.2 and the whole thing depends on them. That's poor sim as you were saying that you don't like to introduce Steven for dependencies. They seem okay. Poor at least seems to be a solid package and the whole tellers. Others, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Most of the tidyverse packages are it's usually all right to depend on them because they mark everything if they're you know gonna deprecate it. Or if it's been superseded, they're good about like marking all that, so you can kind of know what you can depend on and what you can't depend on. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it just it just does introduce a dependency, but it's not like one that you would need to be worried about generally. The map functions, I mean, especially the the if like the predicate ones, um, mm -hmm. I use frequently for. Well, I guess you can use like mutate if as well. That's yeah, some... but they they <laughs> deprecated those. <laughs> Did they? And now okay. now yeah. you use across. Hmm. Uh, okay. So you say like mutate across, then you put you can put a predicate, or you use the select the tidy select. Okay. Cool. Okay. So that's good to know. 
I did not notice that that was deprecated. Um, but yeah, that is useful frequently because, and I mean, he says like, Hadley says don't use the twiddle when you have to use the brackets and write a multi-line expression. But I don't know, I do that all the freaking time. Like, so yeah. I should probably change it, but it's everywhere over like the last two and a half mm -hmm. years of writing. So I have like a very long one from my dissertation. <laughs> That's like many, many, many lines of just like, if, else, this, that. Yeah. They accumulate. These things are sedimentary, one on top of the other. I thought it was interesting that he didn't mention the do dot call, but maybe that's like too specific. Does it come later though? Yeah. Yeah. Because do dot call is, he's probably going to talk about that in reference to non standard evaluation, because that's okay. where it starts to become a thing. to be used more regularly. I don't know, yeah, map, these, these functions are highly, highly useful. Yeah. Um, it's all I had, sorry. I was gonna say, we lost Emily, so she'll have to watch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble I had is that I was always doing um, loops and changing the idea of the loop towards the function, takes a shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my advisor, he doesn't really, he didn't really use R, but he was, knew for loops were slow. So he was like, just use apply. And then I didn't like apply. So then I use map. I found a map precisely because apply was a mess. I, I was not getting what I needed and it was not clearly, it was not clear what I was doing. But I didn't know about all the other 22 variants. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. Because one of the problems was I was getting a lot of, yes, we saved. I was, I was, a client required a huge amount of graphics. So I was iterating to the graphics and all I get is a boom, 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 graphic done. All kinds of errors and messages about the graphic. Yes, I got the graphics. Perfect. So now I know, I just walk it. <laughs> oh yeah, people love the, the drawings. Mm -hmm. One thing that I was puzzled by recently was like using accumulate and I wanted it to accumulate and I was using this uh, custom function and you cannot give it null as your initial value because I didn't want like an initial value. I just wanted the results of each one. And it does not work when you do that. It will it will error if you give it a null as the first value, you have to give it something mm -hmm. as the first value. That's interesting. Does anyone else find themselves using just pmap rather than using map2? Because all the time I end up, I find myself writing with pmap instead just because I just find it easy, automatically easy to go to that as soon as I move from map, from map. as soon as I need any more than one, I move over to pmap. I, I suspect there's probably a cost um, in terms of processing there, but I've never benchmarked it. Yeah. And I also I am aware that, um, sorry, gone. Oh, I don't know. I just like the, when you use the twiddle and you can say dot X and dot Y instead of like dot, dot, dot one and all that. But I think you can use the names too, right? In PMAP, you don't have to do like dot, dot, dot one. Yeah, you, he says to in certain part of the book to get used to kind of specifying them rather than just relying on the names, doesn't he? So when you're doing PMAP, you, um, you select, you know, it's a bit like doing a, a normal function. You select the names that you're going to throw in there. Mm -hmm. 
Although I have found that sometimes that can cause errors with um, if you've got like another fu function coming in that's creating low, um, uh, more data um, columns. And that sometimes if you're doing it a lot of um, repetition, that it can add appendages to the column names because of, um, uh, I think it's to do with the confusion between if there's a similar, um, similar items being created. So what I found out with in particular was, what was it? Coefficients. So when I was pulling out uh, coefficients, because they have the same name, it then appended a dot, uh, x dot coef to the column name. And then when I, even though I'd turned that into or mutated that column name, it continued to have the X. I, I don't quite understand why that had happened entirely, um, but it's something to do with not being specific enough in the namings. And that's where you can sometimes get some errors in there. So you've got to be very careful with making sure that you get your names through when you're mapping through um, mutations. Uh, there was a one more thing as well. Um, so Hadley on um, on Stack Overflow actually mentions the benchmarking of Map, and he does say that there is actually a cost to using Map over L Apply. So L Apply is uh, a little bit is a little bit faster. Um, so I presume it's a little bit more lightweight because Map does have some warnings in there that perhaps L Apply doesn't. I'm not sure. That makes sense. But what about in terms of going back to the function, going back to your code uh, later on, which is clearer, and or sharing with other people, seeing which is clearer, which is easier to understand, and or modify, because that. that I think it honestly depends on what they use and are most familiar yeah. with. I guess it would be to not use an anonymous function <laughs> and make everything a function. Because then they can just choose kind of which one they want. I do have a horrible habit of doing that, of just writing functions <laughs> which are completely unnecessary sometimes, just to make it a bit more explicit in the uh, in the mapping. It's really bad practice. Yeah. See, that's the thing that that's why I write all the lambda functions because I'm like, oh, do I really have to turn this into an explicit function? And for some reason, I have a weird aversion to just making all these functions with weird random names that to do some like you know conditional thing and I'm like do I really need to write a function for that now Hadley really I am um, I was just reading about functional factories which is what I'm doing next week and just one of the things that you see is that they kind of rely on um the functional environment Sorry, they rely. They have their own functional environments, but at the same time, they kind of rely on linking to the function, which is linked into base up, which is linked into the base. Sorry, into the global environment itself, which makes me wonder: Do they then execute? They execute in their own environment, but do they have to call the environment of the function that they're calling? Which I don't think that mm. they do. But seems like something in my head it makes sense that they would have to call that into themselves and then use up and then take over that environment well you could use browser and find out <laughs> well yeah I haven't, I haven't had an opportunity to do that yet i just thought i'd get a head start on reading it before um next week because i've not really done an awful lot on uh, on the um, functional factories before anyway Actually, um, speaking of browser how do you really use browser because I don't know how to use it. <laughs> uh, you just, you you put it wherever you want the browser to open in your code. Um, and you can add a, a conditional on it too. So like the ways I use it that are probably most useful is like when I know something's uh, breaking, for a certain reason, I will like use try and I'll wrap whatever code that I think is breaking it in try and save that to a variable. 
And then I'll use browser with the EXPR, like the conditional expression and just say, if, uh, you know, like inherits whatever variable I named the try results mm -hmm. uh, is a try error class, then open the browser. So it basically so will just stop it when it fails. Does it have to be an error? I guess I needed to investigate a warning earlier. And I ended up just like viewing the source code and testing it. Yeah, um, it doesn't have to be an error. You can put whatever expression you want for browser or you can just put browser in there without and it'll open automatically. Like if there's browser anywhere in the code, it'll open up the browser at that point. Um, I actually have, uh, utils recover that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which is somewhat like browser. It, uh, it's a little higher level though. It lets you move around the whole call stack and open up a browser in any particular function in the call tree. And you can add that to your, like our profile or your, our profile. And as the, function that gets called when an error happens. So whenever you have an error, you can like go anywhere in your call stack and figure out why it happened. Like what, what was going through from your data that caused the error. And you can kind of step through the code and figure out what, what happened and why it erred. Do you have any good examples of that, Stephen? Yeah, um, uh, I mean, the best way to see it is just like, um, if you, if you, I mean, if you put that in there with like options, error equals utils, colon, colon, recover, you'll see how it works at like whenever R encounters an error, you'll get the call stack and it'll let you choose a number to in, to go into your call stack. And then you'll be in the environment uh, as it was when the function went through it. And you can look at the variables in that environment. And so you can see like what your input data was and you can step through the code uh, related to that environment and see where it actually breaks. And because a lot of times when you get the error, you'll be further down the call stack inside of like some mm. package where the error gets detected and it won't be obvious like what happened with what you put in it that caused the error. And so that's why I've, it's one of those things that like once I learned about it a couple of weeks ago, I use it all the time now uh, because it's very useful for figuring out like where the user error occurred um, that caused it. So that sounds that's like really useful. I'm, I'm yeah. having a bit of problem with some code, which I think that'd be really useful for right now. It's super useful, yeah, for debugging. It's definitely was like revelatory when I discovered it. I had, I had known about browser for a long time, but browser, you've got to like kind of have an intuition about where you should put your browser mm. uh, code. And if you don't have an intuition about that, utils recover is a good way to do it. There's also, if you turn on like in our studio, um, it's like tools, uh, global options, I think, or no, no, it's under debug, sorry. It's under debug and it is on error. And you go to, I think it's error inspector. Uh, you'll get the option of like rerun with debug. And that will, that basically reruns your code. And as soon as it hits the error, it opens the browser. And so you'll get a chance to see how like the browser works there. Mm -hmm. And that's where you'll see that like it'll often open in like some sub function of a package. And you're like, well, this is useless. But if you use mm -hmm. utils recover, you can like, step up the call stack to where your data went in and look at what actually went in and why it, why the error was caused.
for this, chapter 22. Are you going to do it? <laughs> yeah, I'll do. I could do chapter 22 for sure. I use it a lot. There's also a, a neat trick with PMAP, which August, you might already know this, um, that you can use, it's like a uh, list to environment and you call rlang dot, dot, dot lists or dots list and the dot, 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 and then environment and it will bind all of your variables in, like if you're doing it on a data frame, it'll bind all your variables in your data frame as their column names in the environment. So you can refer to them by name, like you would do if you use with or something like that, um, which is kind of useful if you have a data frame that you're passing to PMAP and you've got like 13 variables and using the dot dot one or dot dot five dot dot eight, you'd have to like look back at your column names to remember like what variable is getting passed in there. But if you do that little hack, you can use the variables by name and the code ends up a little more readable. That's gonna be <laughs> a baby trick. That's a lot of learning. Yeah, it is kind of hacky. I don't know if they'd approve of that, but I've used it a lot. It works well. It works, it works. If it works, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Debugging is really hard. It's the, it's the bit I find the most difficult, to be honest. You know, when, when you've got a bit of, when you, particularly when you've mapped over a lot of data and you've done, you know, and you've got the same function repeating over huge numbers of lists, like, well, you know, you, and sometimes you can't find where your error is. So you have to run the code and it's like finding where that, finding where that error is, I always find particularly difficult. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Yeah. Definitely. I suppose that's the biggest problem with mapping in general. Um, because if you do, you know, you've got to make sure your code looks on works on a small scale, but as soon as you start moving to larger scale when you throw in more data, it's where, that's when the real problems with like error handling come into their own when it comes to doing the mapping functions. Mm -hmm. um, something that I still think I'm quite weak on. Yeah, that's where the browser and the like using the error inspector feature of, of R really come in handy is being able to stop when it and go into it wherever it runs into an error. It gets even trickier when it happens in a background process. That's just that's just hell when you're trying to do parallel because you can't use browser and you can't use recover and you can't use any of the tools to do it interactively when it's behaving differently in a background process than it does in our studio, which happens on occasion. Mm -hmm. Who's presenting next week? That's me. Okay. I'm doing next week. Nice. Oh yeah, you said that already. Yeah, yeah. We're already Crazy. preparing, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but like, <laughs> it's a bit, it's a bit of a busy week next week, which is why I started preparing. Um, because um, we're still in lockdown over here in the UK, so um, I've been living with my partner for the last few months, so. I've, uh, my house has just been sat there empty so I've got to go back and uh, look you know see pr prospective tenants and make sure they're okay uh, and at the same time like because I, you know it's really hard to it's not the right time to sell a house and then um, oh, but really? at the same time it is here <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep. yeah two houses on my, on our, my mom's street are like sold in like a day <laughs> The um, one across the street got like three hundred thousand, or no, sorry, thirty thousand over listing yeah. price. Um, I'm them. in Illinois, the Chicago suburbs. Ah, uh, interesting. Oh, uh, that's because pe people are moving out of the city centers, aren't they? Oh, well, I don't yeah. know what's like in America, but in the UK, like, um, 
a lot of people have like homes in the city centres or, or like near the city centres and now they're all moving out to where the countryside is. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine you've got a bit more of it in America than what we have over here. Um, but I have heard things about hor- horrific traffic in places like LA and New York and people not really wanting to deal with that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, luckily, we're, we're in jobs where you don't necessarily need to be in the city centre that often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's moving that way. It's also those cities, there's like a buyer like market as well because like you were saying, it got bought up in like a day because the people leave and then it's still a area that people want to live in. So somebody else comes and scoops it up like immediately. Yeah, it's, it's amazing really how like people, different people respond in very different ways. Um, <laughs> Uh, like over here it's just all about green space at the moment uh, and people getting out of flats um, because loads of people live in really small flats and you know as soon as you're locked down there it's like well it's a great place to live if you're living in a city centre but when you're um, when you're locked down you've got nowhere to go and you can't walk around (laughs) yeah you you don't you don't want to be in say you know 50 meter squared apartment do you no no Yeah, Are my you brother. Can... Oh, sorry. Let's go ahead. Come here, you're... Go Where are ahead, you guys? Camille. Sorry? Where are you? I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, so we have plenty of space, and prices have gone up 50% in the last three or four years. Wow. Nice. The great areas to live in, then. So bad. <laughs> it has good things and bad things. Where are you, August? Where are you living? Uh, I live in Sheffield, so I'm next to the Peak District. Oh. Um, if you know what that is, um, <laughs> which I prob- probably don't. Um, it's just a small, it's a small bit of countryside near um, uh, old mining. Well, a big mining, old mining city, I suppose. It's very industrial um, down in the town, and then outside, it's more kind of like. Okay. Um, you know, buildings from the 1700s, all stone and looking quite, um, quite grey. And sorry for myself, to be honest, but um, <laughs> it's also beautiful in another way. So uh, yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's not too bad over here. You know, lockdown's ending soon, so we go back to being normal and then spiking up those COVID rates again. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we ongoing battle. We won't tell you the numbers around here. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's going through the roof right now. Oh, I just heard the stories from people that came from Thanksgiving visiting friends. Like, yeah, it's about to go like insane through through the roof. Yeah, yeah. I heard Is... something like someone was like dying every minute or something. Oh. Yeah, uh, Tom Frieden to ex CDC. I had that article today on CNN and he was like every six seconds person gets sick every minute person dies we are getting a thousand two hundred people dead per day and it's going up and 50 million people travel for Thanksgiving yeah, yeah it's got an exponential growth curve doesn't it um you know it follows is it, you know typical kind of disease patterns which is why you see all these like day science uh things where they're looking sorry uh, modeling competitions i suppose yes but when you try to explain exponential growth to people they don't see it one two four the next one is going to be five no that's not how it works <laughs> yeah it's a bit like the shit about the masks like um i, I mean I, like i mean i don't mean to hammer into your country about it but like you know <laughs> all, <laughs> We're still we on recording, care. so they might blackmail you. <laughs> <laughs> they give you. They, they agree with you. That's true. We are <laughs> still recording. There was some re- there was some research that basically showed that if you um you know that there was this, some people in like South uh what was it uh, South Korea, and they went to work with them. one of them went to work on a mask on and like spread it to like you know maybe two three other people and the other one didn't wear a mask and spread it to like fifty people or something ridiculous like that. It's like masks aren't great 
but they still are helpful. And even even over here, where we've had quite big problems because we're really densely populated, mm. virtually the whole country, you still see people just walking around the streets without masks on, and it's just like you know have a bit of you know think about the impact on other people. But you know, um, you know, people have a right to um, act how they want, I suppose, whether that be good or bad. <laughs> yeah, I was reading somebody talking about how their like workplace environment is super toxic they're like the only person that wears a mask and the manager Mm -hmm. like doesn't believe he believes it's like a hoax and he like tells everybody who walks into the store to take off their mask it's like craziness sometimes freedom is bad for people <laughs> I know yeah. that really awesome. sometimes, like, yeah. you know we, we we've got all this freedom and I, I think um you know when you go back to greek philosophers aristotle had, was it aristotle or socrates had a big problem with the amount of freedom that people had by saying yes we can all vote but we need to be able to know what we're doing when we're doing when we're doing that and i think mm-hmm. that can apply to a lot of things which is we can learn all we want from newspapers or, you know, whatever our local, our biased input of information is. And that regardless of that, um, we're going to make bad choices or bad decisions. And sometimes we need, you need to just have someone, you know, particularly someone who you vote for step in and say, this is the thing that we have to do. Um, anyway, sorry. I've used up <laughs> yeah. about COVID. <laughs> there was a famous group that said that everything is politics. An old rock group. So, Skunk and Nancy? You never heard of Skunk and Nancy? I've heard Skunk and Nancy. Okay, so you know that. Everything <laughs> is political. So, yeah. Yeah. To some extent, everything is political. I mean, you know, everything we do, you know, even like, um, you know, doc- democratization of data and how that's used, mm. you know, in our own fields. That's um, you know quite a massive thing. It's led to massive advantages, and you know when you look at companies now saying things like, you know, we'd rather use open source rather than have something like um, you know SPSS or something like that. It tells you an awful lot about how they think that uh, certain platforms are better than others. Um, I believe that most companies are getting rid of like Flash for that particular reason, mm-hmm. and you know HTML is better, isn't it? HTML5. And it's secure, but also it's open source, I believe. Is that right? And you don't want to be paying licenses to Oracle, that's for sure. <laughs> as long as there is perception, there will be politics. Mm. On happy news. <laughs> 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 How was you? Oh, good. You'll be fine. How was everybody else's Thanksgiving? It was, was good. Yeah. Small. <laughs> yeah. We just saw three people. The ones that live here, four people. Yeah. I just saw one person. And, and cats and animals. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like out in the middle of nowhere right now, which during pandemic, I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Is, um, is Thanksgiving actually bigger than Christmas in America? Because I've heard people saying that before, but um, obviously I've never actually had a chance to ask anyone who lives in America. Not um, Christmas is, I don't know. Uh, I'd say... I'd- Probably, if you talk about like how many people celebrate it, like probably just because, I mean, I know that like, well, at least like this year, especially there's a lot more awareness around uh, like the Native American perception of Thanksgiving Yeah, um, because it's a very different sentiment around Thanksgiving because the way that Americans perceive Thanksgiving is kind of just not the way it actually was from their perspective. Um, the original Thanksgiving was the celebration of a massacre. Hey, we killed all these <laughs> people. Hey, let's have a party. Yeah, it was like, it was a trying to do, like create a peace offering and then like creating agreements that we then like just steamrolled 
and didn't uphold and kind of, you know, trail of tears ran Indian uh, Removal Act, just like pushed them into Oklahoma with nothing to eat. Um, so it's really bad from their perspective. And there's like a, a day of mourning for Native Americans on the day, but that they represent like 2% of the population. Whereas when you look at like Christmas, it's uh, kind of uh, like Christian affiliated. And so a lot of people who are of uh, like non-Christian um, background don't particularly celebrate it. So like Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah, um, non-Christian Asian people celebrate just don't celebrate anything during that time of year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but Thanksgiving is a punctual thing. Bam, happy. It's Thursday, the end. Whereas Thanksgiving, you have all the days coming to that. You have all the events, Christmas, all the most yeah. packed people. Everybody expecting gifts from coworkers to family to neighbors to all the acquaintances you met ten years ago and you still send a card. <laughs> I had to send my cars. I just remember. <laughs> it's like that it's like hi haven't talked in 20 years how are you <laughs> well you're a good friend you're a very good friend if you if you do that <laughs> just, just try to keep in touch with people I, yeah they disappear so well it was a pleasure everybody thanks yeah. for the presentation yep. Camilo yep. I think Thank and you. I'm looking forward to the to your August. Yeah, uh, we will. We'll, we'll, we will see. I uh, I hope that I don't. I've got a bit of time to write it up. Out of interest, how do you um, make sure, like, when you're having slides, you're adding like images and stuff like that? Is it all on the um, R4DS uh, GitHub that explains how to do how to do that? I oh. just went and researched Sharingan, which is the the, yeah, there's a book for it, I think. Let me I think you can just here. use knitter. Usually I use like knitter include underscore graphic. But there are other ways to do it. I used it with the, the Sharingan. And when you go to our studio, you create new presenta markdown presentation all the way to the bottom, Ninja. And that creates the whole page. And Sharingan has good explanations of how to add things. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, That's there's cool. a markdown shorthand with like exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. it's like in brackets you can give a caption and then in parentheses you give the and I don't let me check the code for the little picture okay. I put there. Dun, 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 dun. The picture of the little dog. Uh it was just Oh, it was trying to be background image. Oh, yeah. And it has a, yeah. There's like try. a funny setting, this like YOLO is true that will put a random photo. Oh, yeah. I was, <laughs> I was going to maps. I, I, the whole thing was maps. I put a picture of the maps, the, the singer of the, of the yeah, yeah, singing maps. Uh -huh. Maps. I uh, <laughs> love you like a. Uh, but the images never quite gel. So like, okay, I scrubbed mm. the whole thing. I'm scared. Um, oh. yeah. Well, it's certainly going to be quite a learning process this week, isn't it? <laughs> it's easy. You it's... could just like look, probably learn by just looking in someone else's like cohort one's markdown file. Oh, oh yeah, that's a that's a great idea. I might just nick the code. <laughs> I'd probably just nick the code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the easy way to do it is just get theirs and then build on top of it. But then you have yeah. to know why they did now. That's how I uh, started <laughs> off learning art. When I first started learning, I, what was that, 2012, I think. Um, they're just like, oh, just copy the code. It's like, why can't I just click buttons like SPSS? It's like, oh, no, no. You, you just like type this bit of code and you just move this bit. And you... you the first time I did that, it's just error, 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 all the time. Errors. <laughs> oh God, what, what is this? I actually, um, I failed my foot. I've never ever failed an exam. And the first exam I ever failed was in the R. And ironically, it's the thing that I've spent the most time learning ever since. <laughs> <laughs> you were... Yeah. 
Yeah, out of spite. You will not be defeated. Yeah, exactly. I hate losing. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. You know, who, no one likes to get, no one likes to fail an exam. No. Okay. See you guys next week. Yeah. All right. Bye, bye, everybody. Okay.